welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship for Sunday, October 4th. This is the Sunday we will celebrate St. Francis of Assisi, and we will be blessing our animals. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Francis, from the town of Assisi, was born in about 1181. He was someone who saw God reflected in nature. He was a great lover of God's creation, and he gave God thanks for Brother Sun, Sister Moon, Brother Wind, Water, Fire, and Earth, all things he saw rendering praise to God. Many stories surround the life of Francis, and they said his great love of animals and the environment continued. One account describes how one day, while Francis is walking on a road with his friends, they happened upon a place where there were birds on both sides of the road. Francis told his companions, to wait for me while I go preach to my sisters, the birds. The birds surrounded him, intrigued by the power of his voice, and not one of them flew away. He is often portrayed with a bird, typically in his hand. In 1979, Pope John Paul II declared Francis the patron saint of ecology. The Pope said, as a friend of the poor who was loved by God's creatures, St. Francis invited all of creation animals, plants, natural forces, brother sun, and sister moon, to give honor and praise to the Lord. October 4th is the day that we celebrate St. Francis by blessing our animals. Throughout today's service, you will see pictures of animals that you all hold dear. And now pause this video and go get your pet. Are you back? Let's bless our animals. Almighty and everlasting God, creator of all things and giver of all life, let your blessing be upon all of our animals. May our relationships with them mirror your love and our care for them be an example of your bountiful mercy. Grant the animals health and peace. Strengthen us to love and care for them as we strive to imitate the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God's servant, Francis. Amen. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Listen to the bass, it's the one on the bottom where the bullfrog croaks and the hippopotamus moans and groans with a big to-do and the old cow just goes moo. The dogs and the cats, they take up the middle where the honeybee hums and the cricket fiddles, the donkey brays and the pony neighs and the old coyote howls. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Listen to the top where the little birds sing on the melodies with the high notes ring. The hoot owl hollers over everything and the jaybird disagrees. Singing in the night time, singing in the day, the little duck quacks and he's on his way. The possum ain't got much to say, and the porcupine talks to himself. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. It's a simple song of living sun everywhere by the ox and the fox and the grizzly bear, the grumpy alligator and the hawk above, the sly raccoon and the turtle dove. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit 
to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I shall make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but he saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the unsurpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of the resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace. We hear a lot about vineyards in today's readings. On the day that Jesus gave his teaching, which is a parable about a vineyard, everyone who was there would have been familiar with the story that we heard earlier uh, from Isaiah about the vineyard. And vineyard here is an image for the people that God loved so much. And we hear first of the loving kindness of God and then God's sorrow as the vineyard fails to flourish. Now, Isaiah is a very long book, and we only hear it in little snippets on a Sunday morning. But if we were to read it straight through, we would find first God's hope that Israel would be a source of peace and so attractive to other nations that they would flock to try to be like it. And then the people ruin that plan by making these really unholy alliances with idolatrous countries instead of trusting God to protect them. And then they begin to pick up the characteristics of those idolatrous countries. Various prophets were sent to try to warn them. Uh, Jeremiah would be one of them uh, that they tried to kill because they didn't like what he had to say, even though the prophets had come only to help, to give warning. And finally, God sees the best option is to wake the people up by allowing them to be taken captive by the Babylonians and allows the city of Jerusalem and the temple to be ransacked. So when the people of, of Jesus' era heard language about uh, vineyard, they would think right away of Isaiah and listen for some of the same words about the fence and the watchtower and the wine press, because those images would flash into people's minds the time when their own country had really brought on its own doom. And notice that the problem was, it was not that the vineyard didn't bear any fruit at all. It was more that they went their own way. They received all this loving care from the, the vineyard owner, and then they came up with wild fruit. It was useless. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 33. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce in the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. This may be a story that Matthew especially wanted to include in his gospel because among his first readers there were many, many Jewish Christians. But whenever you hear a story of something that the Jews did or the Pharisees did, 
Remember, we should look in the mirror because the story is given to us for our instruction. And in our human nature, we all tend to do the same things. Jesus was at this point very close to the final conflict with the religious leaders that would lead to his crucifixion. And he was certainly not making nice with them in this whole series of parables. Remember the portion that we heard last week about uh, the vineyard owner with the two sons. And he told them to go to work. One of them accepted the job and then he didn't do it. And some of the religious leaders may have flashed back on that same Isaiah reading. And they saw themselves as pretty thinly disguised in the story of the two sons. Since Isaiah also talked about people who were entrusted with a job and then didn't do it. And the son that seemed useless for the task ended up doing it. And they could see that Jesus had picked up a lot of useless looking people and treated them quite seriously. The crowds included all kinds of Gentiles. These were people who would be coming from, coming from strange religious beliefs. They certainly weren't the people that God had entrusted with God's message. These were people who knew nothing of the, the purity codes. Some of them came from sleazy professions. And Jesus told the religious leaders that these are the ones who are going to go in before you in the kingdom of God. And today's story is about these horrible, wretched people that everyone agrees should be put to a miserable death, stealing the landlord's crops, abusing his servants, even killing his son. And Matthew tells us that the chief priests and Pharisees knew that Jesus was talking about them. And historically, their leadership had persecuted the prophets that God sent to speak the truth to them. I brought a picture of one of them. This is a picture a picture of what it might have been like for Isaiah or uh, Jeremiah. He was thrown into this dried up well. It wasn't really quite dry. And this was no prank. There was some question that they would ever be able to get him out because he sunk so far into the muck. It took 30 men to pull him out. And they had to take rags to put under for him to put under his armpits so that the, the ropes wouldn't just cut into his arms. So they had persecuted these people who were all, uh, the prophets were sent to help them. And then after Jesus was executed, the church, of course, has interpreted the tenant farmers killing the landlord's son uh, as corresponding to the treatment that Jesus received. And the chief priests and the Pharisees were right to see themselves in that story. And the Jewish Christians were right to see what the leadership had done, how they had failed them. And maybe this story helped them to understand why Jesus was reaching out beyond his own people to whoever wanted to be a disciple. He reached out to whoever wanted to be part of the kingdom here on earth. But I believe that Matthew and his fellow teachers could have uh, given those lessons to the Jewish church just by teaching them then and there. Uh, and without planting these stories in his gospel to be shared as sacred scripture, through the church everywhere for all time. He could have dealt with any Jewish dirty laundry just privately. Unless this story is for us too. And the risk that Matthew ran and the risk that God ran by inspiring the church to include these parables in our scriptures is that we Gentiles would point a finger at the Jews and then give ourselves a pat on the back. We assume that we would never be so foolish and uh, and never be so evil as to behave like those tenant farmers. No wonder the mission was taken from the Jews. And of course, that would be conveniently forgetting that all the early disciples were Jews. Uh, Paul, in the passage that we heard today, told the Philippians just how Jewish he was. And even though he set aside his pride in that pedigree, actually his education in the scriptures served him very well. God had chosen a, a well-grounded man. Well, thinking that this story is about a Gentile church replacing Israel would conveniently also ignore the piety and the faithfulness of the Jewish people right up into the, the present day. How do you feel about people in other countries seeing uh, our political leadership or, or some of our political leadership? You want to say, well, yes, but that's not who we are. You're looking at the worst caricature. Or how do you feel about 
publicizing some of the abuses done in the name of the church. Is that the only church that you know? I think if you were Jewish, you might feel the same way about uh, those leaders who weren't faithful being seen as representing everyone who practices their faith. And that was Jesus' faith. And thinking that this is a, a church versus synagogue story sets us up to be exactly like the chief priests and Pharisees on that day. Where are you and I in that story today? We are right there with all the people over all of the ages who see that stone that God has chosen to be the cornerstone and walk right by and think it's useless, thinking that it's a stone that the stonemason would reject. That quotation about the cornerstone that Jesus quoted is taken from the Psalms. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. And if you study the Psalms, the mindset of any priest should have been to know that God typically chooses the person who seems the least likely. With this kind of history, you might think that temple leadership and the Pharisees would be looking for God to work um, in the, the humblest one, the one who shuns political power, the one who preaches forgiveness, the one who encourages love for the enemy, someone like Jesus. Instead, at this point in the story, they are well on their way to sending him to the cross. The tenants in the story are looking at the landlord's son through a lens of pure greed. They don't say, look, this is the guy's son. It's, this is the heir. This is the money bags. And this is a parable, and we're not told how they're going to transfer all this property to themselves. But uh, to them, he represents, the son represents only worldly riches to them. You know, tenant farmers in the best scenario are supposed to be invited into a win-win situation. Uh, you tend my farm, you tend my garden, work my land, you get some of the crop. And here they, they turn on the one who is intending to do them good. And when the sun comes, after this tremendous abuse of the, the landlord and his servants, the sun comes and he's not bringing a goon squad of fighters to, uh, to kill them or get rid of them. But amazingly, he is still willing to deal with them. And they willfully refuse to see him as anything but a nuisance to be gotten rid of so that they can steal what isn't theirs. He means nothing to them as a person, nothing to them as an emissary of the landlord. He's useless. He's just a final obstacle to their taking over this piece of land. Well, our lives are pretty far removed from vineyards, and I'm pretty sure no one can uh, identify with murdering someone to steal their inheritance. But we all do and say things without realizing what we're doing. And one of the things that we can do uh, is to, to easily overlook the stone that God chooses as the, the cornerstone of the kingdom, that stone that Jesus identifies as himself. And if this parable is true to life in our own lives, we are in danger of ignoring it, rejecting it, abusing it, even trying to, to crush it out. Let's try looking at this parable not as a story of blame, but a story of lost opportunity. You are called on to tend your part of the garden that's our world. And maybe you have administrative gifts, maybe you have the, the talent and the means uh, to have quite a bit of influence in your community. Or maybe you're one of those ones that we're learning to call the essential workers who actually make the things happen and Jesus is walking in our midst. Do you or I recognize when this is happening? The parable suggests that it might not always be obvious. He appears like the stone that the mason didn't want. Maybe it looked cracked or misshapen. Maybe it was the wrong color to fit in. And Jesus was without sin, but remember that the people are now the physical body of Christ on earth, and we are not without sin. Look at David. He was rejected at first just for who he was. Um, he was the kid brother, then he was the commoner, the one that uh, is actually more skilled than, than King Saul was. Those aren't terrible things. But then as he grew older, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want your single daughter or your sister or your niece to be introduced to him. He was a flawed man. 
So maybe we are doubly likely to miss the presence of Jesus among us, because first the world tells us to prefer wealth and clout, power over, uh, might makes right. We're not, we're not taught to appreciate the, the gentle and humble in heart. We can reject the weak-looking stone right there, because the values are wrong. They look weak. And then there's the fact that Jesus moves in and through our neighbors who really do have weaknesses. Short tempers, timidness, selfish thoughts, short attention spans, defense, defensiveness, the list could go on. You will never meet the perfect person and God will never call the perfect person to tend the garden. God will never send your way the perfect person for you to minister to one who's always sweet and appreciative and deserving of your gifts or your efforts. God will never give you the perfect team of co-workers. And of course, I have to remember that people will be looking at me and not thinking that I look very much like a facet of the cornerstone either. And if we don't get past that, then we slip right into the role of the priests and the Pharisees that day, the ones who were trusted with the task of serving the people but with this distorted idea of what a person of God is like. We slip right into the role of the tenant farmers, trusted to tend the garden, the treasured vineyard, and, and trying to destroy the very source of their blessing. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. We don't know exactly what that means, but remember pronouncements of doom in the Bible are always actually meant for our instruction. They're meant kindly. They're meant to turn us in our behavior. And one way a life is broken to pieces is to come to the end of your days, you know you were given some abilities, uh, a call to use them, a call to follow, a call to be in partnership with God, and to realize you've missed the boat. You missed out on the reason you were put on earth. Many people find this story terribly negative, and it is not any preacher's favorite one. Jesus told this story, and Matthew wrote it down, because it shows us all how needless it is to go on our selfish way, heedlessly tripping on the stone, almost begging it to fall down on us, when blessings are intended for us. Let this story and the words of Isaiah be an invitation to us. Share the work, share in the journey, share in the life, and share in the fruits. Amen. Jesus
Now let us confess our faith using the words that unite Christians the world over, the words at the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving God, inviting God, empowering God, look with kindness and mercy on your world and on our country. Bless our endeavor to govern ourselves with justice and peace. As there are chaos and power struggles around us, let us be thoughtful and open-minded. Let us be strong in our resolve to work for the common good. Let us be respectful to people who disagree with us. Guide us to choose leaders who will care for us. Inspire those trusted with government or business leadership to be honest and make wise decisions. We pray also for ourselves. Help us discern your presence among us in the work you set for us to do, in finding the helpers we need, in following you in our lifestyle and decisions. Make us mindful that you are our shepherd and our maker and that we need your care. We give thanks this day for the lessons of St. Francis. Make us instruments of your peace. We give thanks for the animals, the ones who comfort and delight us, and also the ones who give us food. Help us to be respectful of all of them, the companions and the farm animals. We pray for the creation for those fighting fires or floods. We want to be better stewards of the garden. Guide us to personal habits and public policies that respect the climate, the air, and water. We pray for relief from the pandemic, for healing for those afflicted, comfort for those who've lost loved ones, strength and mental well-being for caregivers and hospital workers, inspiration for researchers, and safety for those providing our goods and services. Help students, teachers, and parents to cope with closed schools. Let there be relief for those losing jobs and businesses. Help us to keep one another safe. We pray for those whose lives are closely linked with ours. We lift up to your care Cannon, Mona, Dorothy, Kathy, and Sandy, and those we name before you now. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family of Betty Raymond. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, trusting in your call to us, trusting in your plans. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray now using the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you.
Peace be with you. Thanks be to God.